Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about biomineralization and this is the part three video to our biomineralization videos and that is because there are still more mineral examples to go over regarding minerals that form by biologically induced biomineralization. The minerals we'll be going over in this video include carbonates, phosphates, sulfates, and sulfides. So let's get started. Just to recap over biomineralization basics, we talked about in the first biomineralization video that there are two types of biomineralization. These include biologically induced mineralization and biologically controlled mineralization. In this video, in the last one, we talked about mineral examples of biologically induced mineralized minerals, but in the upcoming two videos after this one, we'll talk about examples of biologically controlled mineralized minerals. <laughs> and just to recap before we get into the examples, how biologically induced mineralization works, it basically means that back bacterial or microbial cells provide reactive surfaces on which minerals can nucleate or begin to form and then grow, and microbes provide metabolic byproducts that might also help in terms of mineralization by providing certain ions that can react with other ions to start the process of mineral formation. And like we mentioned in that video as well, there are many examples of minerals that form by biologically induced mineralization. These include iron hydroxides, magnetite, manganese oxides, clays, amorphous silica, carbonates, phosphates, sulfates, and sulfides. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we are talking today about those last four examples because we talked about the first five in the previous video, the part two biomineralization video. I'll link it up here if you want to check that out and also just so you don't get so confused about how many different biomineralization videos there are now on my channel. <laughs> so first, let's start with carbonate. We know from a lot of my videos as well as just general knowledge that a lot of organisms secrete carbonate minerals as their skeleton or shell. And so you might be thinking that this is the type of biomineralization we're talking about when we say biologically induced mineralized carbonate minerals. However, not in this case. That's actually examples of biologically controlled mineralized carbonate minerals. And in this video, we're only talking about those that are induced, not controlled. And so in the upcoming videos, when we do talk about those biologically controlled processes, we'll talk more about things like shell or test or skeleton formation. But in the biologically induced mineralized carbonate section, we're talking about more so how microbes such as photosynthetic cyanobacteria and algae are primary drivers of more passive carbonate production. For example, cyanobacteria promote carbonate precipitation in two main ways. They increase pH just by fixing inorganic carbon or CO2 as part of just their necessary processes to live, not necessarily that they're trying to increase pH. It's just a byproduct of their metabolism. And they also provide surfaces as nucleation sites, like we talked about in many examples in the previous videos. By doing so, they promote the formation of calcium carbonate or calcite and aragonite, strontium carbonate or strontianite, and also, but less commonly, dolomite, which has calcium and and magnesium in its carbonate structure and magnesium carbonate or magnesite. And the reason that they form those manganese rich carbonate minerals less often than the strontium and calcium rich ones is because they preferentially absorb those cations those calcium and strontium cations over magnesium cations. And that makes their nucleation sites more favorable for calcite and strontianite formation than it does for magnesite or dolomite formation. There are also some really small cyanobacteria less than two microns called picoplankton that can facilitate the formation of calcium carbonate, calcite, and aragonite during seasonal blooms. And so we can see kind of a figure of this shown here. We have this picoplankton bloom that then once they die, they fall to the bottom sediment in what's called detrital snow. And as they do so, they transport the calcium carbonate that had encrusted their cells during the bloom to the bottom sediment in thick deposits called whiting events. But planktonic cyanobacteria are not the only calcification inducers. There are also benthic cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria that live on the sea floor that can facilitate the formation of calcium carbonate in macritic coatings, 
crusts and layers on submerged substrata. Ooids are one example of these coatings, these calcium carbonate coatings that form by wave action causing concentric calcium carbonate coating on sand grain, shell fragments, or microbial biomass. But it's not necessarily the wave action or even the grain that's becoming coated that's organic in this process. What the cyanobacteria do is they contribute EPS, their extracellular polymeric substances, to bind the calcium ions and then become nucleation sites for calcium carbonate growth, and they also increase pH in the ambient environment due to their metabolism. Cyanobacteria are also known to form bacterial mats, and these bacterial mat structures are formed by calcium carbonate that they help form and therefore can be preserved as structures called stromatolites or thrombolites. And lastly for carbonates before we get to dolomite, which is a really interesting one, is calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate is another biomineral that can form by the help of fungi, and actually calcium oxalate is commonly the composition of many kidney stones, which can be seen in this microscopic image over here to the right, but in terms of the fungi-induced calcium oxide crystals, they look more like what's shown on the left here. And fungi go a long way in helping the process of calcium oxalate formation because they release organic acid such as oxalic acid that then can react with calcium 2 plus ions to form calcium oxalate. Now moving to dolomite, which is that calcium and magnesium containing carbonate mineral that actually presents a big problem in the field of studying carbonate mineral formation. Abiotic dolomite formation is difficult to achieve at room temperatures and thus typically occurs in nature as a secondary replacement mineral, which makes sense because during diagenesis, temperatures can rise and dolomite can then replace the carbonate mineral that's already there. However, that doesn't explain the formation of dolomite as a primary mineral, which has been seen in the rock record. So how does that happen? Well, it's been shown that SRB or sulfate reducing bacteria can induce primary dolomite formation. But how is this possible if SRB are reducing sulfate and producing sulfide? Wouldn't they just help in sulfide formation like we'll talk about later in this video? Well, yeah, they do that too. But these bacteria, by removing sulfate from the environment, are freeing magnesium ions from being complexed with the sulfate and also increasing pH. This not only promotes dolomite formation by increasing the pH, and obviously carbonate formation is favored in those conditions, but it also frees those magnesium ions to be incorporated within the carbonate that then forms near their cell surface. And lastly, they also provide EPS, extracellular polymeric substances that they can excrete that can act as adsorption sites for anions due to their cation-rich nature. But SRB aren't the only ones that are thought to contribute to primary dolomite formation. Dolomite has also been found in basalt-hosted aquifers in association with methanogens. Methanogens, as their name suggests, produce methane, and the role they play in dolomite formation is thought to be the increase in alkalinity that they provide due to their metabolism, like the SRB. Moreover, in this basalt-rich environment, the dissolution of basalt enriches those methanogen-containing pore waters in calcium and magnesium ions, which then can adsorb to the methanogen cells because of the negative surface charge of methanogen cells and microbial cells in general, and therefore further promoting the formation of dolomite. However, other than calcium carbonate, strontium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, and magnesium calcium carbonate or dolomite, there are also other minerals, siderite or iron carbonate and rhodochrosite, manganese carbonate, that can form due to biologically induced mineralization. Siderite, for example, forms where pore waters are more rich in iron 2 plus or reduced ferrous iron than they are in sulfide, aka too much sulfide means that iron sulfides are going to form and that prevents the formation of siderite or iron carbonate. Therefore, siderite precipitates in suboxic fresh water where low sulfate concentrations constrain SRB or sulfate reducing bacterial activity. Rhodochrosite similarly forms in these environments but can also form in sulfitic ones because sulfitic environments don't restrict rhodochrosite formation the way that they do for siderite. However, whether bacteria in these environments promotes these minerals formation beyond just supplying necessary ions and maybe some reactive surfaces is unclear. And that brings us to phosphates. Phosphate is a really important nutrient in marine phytoplankton, which are able to take up inorganic phosphate, facilitate the transport of phosphate 
phosphate to the bottom sediments when they die. And this phosphate can then be released into the pore waters upon the degradation of the biomass that transported it there. And then the phosphate is free to nucleate on existing substrata. And this can include reactive surfaces of microbial cells. In fact, there is an entire word for fine grain organic rich sediment that contains over 10% phosphate. And that is phosphorite. Phosphorite deposition occurs where upwelling of phosphate rich deep waters leads to high phytoplankton productivity. And obviously, therefore, eventually when those phytoplankton fall to the bottom sediment, they will then transport the phosphorus there and form these phosphorite deposits. And the major component of phosphorite deposits or phosphorite frameworks is microbial structures. High organic matter content has also been found in fossil phosphorites rather than just modern phosphorites. This implies that microbes can actively facilitate phosphate precipitation by providing metal cations for the phosphate to adsorb onto. For example, iron 3 reducing bacteria, like we talked about in the previous video, provide iron 2 cations for forming vivanite, a type of iron phosphate mineral. It's also thought that microbial mats and sheaths act as a barrier preventing phosphate from diffusing back into the water column once it's released into those pore waters. Therefore, it will stay there and react with microbial surfaces and precipitate as microbially induced minerals rather than going back up into the water column. But beyond providing metal cations, it's unclear whether bacteria actually promote phosphate mineralization by providing their reactive surfaces as nucleation sites for mineralization. It's even been shown by experiments that there's actually no evidence that phosphate does preferentially nucleate on cell surfaces over other inorganic surfaces. So this still remains unclear, but likely microbes just kind of give the phosphate metal cations that they can react with. And then maybe if those cations are associated with the cell surface, those phosphate anions will be close to the cell surface when they react with those cations, but there's no actual preference for those phosphate minerals to nucleate on such surfaces. That brings us to sulfates. Sulfates have been shown to facilitate the initial mineralization of gypsum grains by providing calcium cation laden S layers as nucleation sites. What are S layers? Well, it just stands for surface layers. They're layers of the cell surface that are over the cell wall. And so they're the outermost surface layers of the microbes and therefore can act as nucleation sites for minerals that will eventually encrust those cells as they mineralize and grow. And if these S layers become completely mineralized as minerals grow on them, the bacterium can actually shed its S layer to enable it to continue growing. Gypsum has also been found in association with bacterial mats in evaporitic environments. These deposits contain seasonal laminae that actually show high salinity versus low salinity seasons in that evaporitic lake or environment. What I mean by this is that there are layers in the bacterial mat that are gypsum during high salinity periods and during low salinity periods, they're the cyanobacterial mats. And because these layers preserve so well, we can really tell the seasonal changes and variations and durations by these laminae. Some more sulfate minerals that microbes can induce the formation of include celestite or strontium sulfate, barite or barium sulfate, iron sulfate such as jarosite and schwartmanite. I hope I'm saying that right. And we won't talk much about these just because they form in the same general way that we've been talking about for most microbially induced minerals. They form because these sulfate anions are attracted to the cation-laden surfaces of cells for nucleation sites, and some of those cells might even provide ions by their metabolism for the sulfate to react with. Lastly, for this video, we'll be talking about sulfides. Sulfide formation can be facilitated by SRB, like we talked about earlier, sulfate-reducing bacteria. When we talked about them earlier, we talked about how they remove sulfate from the water column and therefore promote dolomite formation by freeing magnesium ions. However, in the case of sulfide formation, they more directly contribute to the promotion of sulfide formation because they're actually producing sulfides. They take sulfate from the water and they transform it to sulfide, which then they release and that can react with cations like iron and form iron sulfides like pyrite or fool's gold. However, as you'll see in a couple slides, pyrite formation is not that simple. It takes a lot of steps. But in general, iron sulfides are an example of the minerals that can form due to this metabolism of SRB. 
However, it's not just their metabolism that can help to produce these sulfide minerals. They also can concentrate iron ions at their cell surface because of their negative surface charge and then act as nucleation sites for iron sulfide minerals. In fact, spheroids of framboidal pyrite shown here suggest mineralization encrusting microbial surfaces. However, even though the microbial surfaces as well as the sulfide that these microbes are producing promotes the formation of sulfide, it's unknown whether the mineralization process, once it gets kicked off, is actually biologically induced or just completely abiotic. Experiments show that iron sulfide minerals do not differ in crystallography when formed in the presence of microbes versus in the absence of microbes. But it remains in debate whether pyrite formation, especially at low temperatures, is directly facilitated by microbes or not. We know that in general, pyrite formation is thought to begin with amorphous iron monosulfide formation by way of the bacterial byproduct sulfide reacting with iron 2 in pore waters. And then this amorphous iron monosulfide actually converts to a more crystalline form of iron monosulfide, then to mckinolite, another iron sulfide mineral all the while increasing in sulfur content as we go down this list of products and that mckinnell white forms gregite again increasing in sulfur content and finally gregite can eventually convert to pyrite but this pyrite conversion from gregite actually requires an extensive crystallographic rearrangement and typically high temperatures so the mechanism of pyrite formation under 100 degrees celsius is still hotly debated it's been suggested that pyrite can directly react with hydrogen sulfide formed by sulfate reducing bacteria to form pyrite. However, how large a role the microbes are playing in this process is still really unclear. So it's really interesting research. Actually, I do a lot in the way of understanding how biology might induce molybdenum iron sulfide minerals, which is really cool. So maybe I'll make a video about that eventually. But to wrap up this video, other common sulfide minerals that form under microbially induced conditions include millerite or nickel sulfide, galena or lead sulfide, sphalerite or zinc sulfide, and chalcopyrite or copper iron sulfide. And similarly to pyrite, these minerals are also thought to have formed due to SRB providing sulfide and nucleation sites, but the exact direct role of microbes and all of their formation processes is still not fully exactly understood. So if you want to go into that research, I encourage you to do so. And that's all I got for you guys today. So I hope you guys are excited for the biologically controlled biomineralization videos. I feel like the last couple of videos have been a lot of repetition because all the biologically induced processes are pretty much very similar. But biologically controlled mineralization is also really cool and a little bit more versatile, I think. So it'll be really cool to go over with you some of those mineral examples and how they work. So I I hope to see you guys there. And lastly, as always, the reference I'm using to make this video, as well as the other biomineralization videos, is Introduction to Geomicrobiology by Kurt Kahnhauser. And this is a great book. It's linked in my description down below, as well as the other references I'm using to help make these videos. And last, if you're still watching this video, comment down below for me what your favorite biologically induced mineral was to learn about. And if there's any that you know of that I didn't hit on, on, then please comment that down below. I'll be curious to see what it is and learn more about it and maybe eventually make a video on it. And with that, thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you guys in the upcoming videos. Bye!